Good afternoon. Welcome to this uh, eDevel Connect webinar. Well, I'm Rachel Raya from the Regenerative Medicine Program, hosting today's talk. And it, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Mireya Blas. Uh, she studied biology and got her PhD from UPF, working on, on regulation of uh, alternative polyannulation and alternative splicing in Eduardo Eira's lab at UPF. Then she underwent uh, postdoctoral training first at University of uh, Copenhagen in, in Crocs lab uh, until 2015, then at the Institute for Medical Systems Biology of the Nicolas Rojeski lab until 2019, where she did uh, re breakthrough studies and, and single cell transcriptomic studies of regional processes. Finally, she came back to Barcelona and did a short postdoctoral uh, stay at the CRG in Manuel Elimia's lab. And finally, in October last year, 2019, she joined the CMRB as an independent group leader, and now she's an independent group leader at the Regenerative Medicine Program, uh, EDVEL. Uh, the group is uh, Gene Regulation of Cell Identity, and she will be talking today about understanding gene regulation with single cell transcriptomics. So, thank you very much, Mireya, and the floor is yours now. Okay, thank you, Uncle. So, yeah, thanks everybody that joined today or that will watch us later on YouTube. My name is Mireya, and today I would like to explain you a bit about gene regulation and how we can study gene regulation using single cell transcriptomics. So just to start, as uh, Angela was introducing, I have been interested all my career in uh, studying gene regulation and post-transcriptional gene regulation. And basically what we understand as post-transcriptional regulation are all the processes that regulate gene expression at the RNA level. And these processes that could be splicing or polyethylation or mRNA export, decay, and things like these are controlled by a combination of proteins and small RNAs and basically shape the final transcriptome that we have in our cells. So before single cell transcriptomics, when we were doing high throughput biology or bioinformatics, so what we had were techniques that were could tell us which is the transcriptomic profile, for instance, of a tissue of interest, and what's the protein repertoire that we have in this tissue. And with this information, what we could see is that we have some different variants, like that have different exons, as this one here, or have different three prime UTRNs that are the result of these gene regulatory programs at the RNA label, like polyethylation or splicing. And with this kind of information, what we could do are things like, for instance, take into tissues, like for instance here the brain and the kidney and compare this transcriptomic profile that we would find in this tissue compared to this other tissue and also look at which are the protein contents here. But the problem with this kind of information is that the type of studies that we can do are not so big because it's really, really hard to try to understand how these proteins relate to these isoforms, so how all this process is regulated. And why is that? Well, the fact is that with bulk RNA sequencing, for instance, it will be as if we have this image that all the cells in the tissue are the same. So all of them have the same RNAs, the same transcripts, the same proteins. And then we actually know that this is not true because the reality is that each tissue is composed by different combinations of cells, each of them having different protein combinations and different gene transcript isoforms. And actually, the changes in the expression within each of these cells and actually the different cell composition of the tissues is actually what defines the transcriptomic profile that we could see. So until now, we were at this level, at the tissue level, at the bulk population level, and our studies were limited. But now with single cell transcriptomics, we can actually study this. And this is a bit what I want you to, to get the idea today. So I want you to see single cell transcriptomics just as a new tool that allows us to study, in my case, gene regulation at a different level. So now we have moved from this 
systems and organs where we can only study like bulk populations, either tissues or cells in culture, or even compare cases and controls of, for instance, a disease. But now we can move to the cellular level. So the things that we can do now are just in more deep. So now we don't have the transcriptomic profile of the brain, for instance, but what we can do is identify which are the cell types and cellular states that we find, for instance, in the brain. And not only identify the cell types, but also study the variability in gene expression in each of these groups of cells. And this is going to allow us to understand, for instance, why some cells react to some treatments or not, or why they change differently given an input from the outside. But we can not only do that, but actually we can study the infer the lineage relationships between these cells try to study how different cell types relate to each other and which are the regulatory processes that are happening that imply the change or the differentiation of a cell type or of another cell type. So having this in mind today, I would like to talk to you about different things that I have been working on in the past few years related to the use of single cell transcriptomics to tackle these things. So the first thing that I would tell you about is to make a cell atlas. So this idea of getting a tissue or an organism and identifying all the cell types that we have to characterize them and to study their relationships. And for this, I will present the work that we did in Planarians where we did a cell atlas of the whole organism. Next, I would talk to you about how we can characterize gene regulation in time. And in this case, I would explain you how we can use single cell transcriptomics, not only to look at gene expression changes with cell cycle progression, but also at isoform changes. So going to the transcript level. And in the end, I would tell you a bit about the most recent work that we are doing that is still really, really starting, in which we are trying to characterize how mouse embryonic stem cells differentiate to neurons and which are the genes that are involved in this process. So now let's start with the first part of the talk. So as I told you a couple of years ago, what we did was to publish an atlas of a whole animal and describe all its cellular lineage tree. And for this, we did the work uh, using planarians. So in case you don't know, planarians are these tiny worms of about half a centimeter in length that they have this awesome ability that they are able to regenerate all their body parts. So what actually does this mean? So it means that if you take this planaria and you cut it in pieces, each of these pieces is able to regenerate a whole adult animal in a matter of 10 days. And now, in fact, this is possible because planarians have a large pool of adult stem cells that is about 30% of the cells that are continuously differentiated and renewing all their tissues. So therefore, if we take now, for instance, a sample of planarians in the adult and we sequence them, we will find not only all these differentiated cell types, but also stem cells and cells in all the steps of the differentiation process. So actually allowing us to reconstruct all the differentiation, so all the cellular lineage tree of this animal in a single experiment. So to do this, Basically, what we use is DROPSIC. So DROPSIC is one of the first droplet-based sequencing methods, so one of the first high-throughput bit methods that were developed. And uh, although now there are many other methods, so all the droplet-based methods have some similarities. So in case you don't know, the main idea is that basically you have a microfluidics device in which you would input your cells and then you will have also your bits that are in lysis buffer and basically you encapsulate it in nano droplets. So basically when the cell is encapsulated in one of these nano droplets, it's sliced and release its RNA content that are going to be captured by these beads that are inside these uh, droplets. These beads contain oligodictis that would capture the mRNAs. And apart from that, they also have a unique molecular identifier that would allow us to identify all the RNAs that we capture and a cell barcode. So when we sequence this data, basically what we will have is like for each mRNA, we'll have a piece of the mRNA that will allow us to identify the gene where it comes from, but also we will have this cellular barcode and this UMI so that we will know which cell each RNA is coming from. 
And basically, we would use this data to generate the so-called digital gene expression matrix in which we summarize the expression of all the genes that we have in our sample and which ones are expressed in each of the cells that we have. So when we do this, then suddenly we have the makeup of a whole tissue or a whole organism in our case. And this sounds very exciting, but actually what it looks is really like this. So this will be the cellular makeup of our planaria. So here we have more than 20,000 cells. Each of the dots is a single cell. So this is a test near representation, but actually this plot doesn't tell us much. So what we know is that cells that are together, for instance, the cells that are here are similar, but we don't know whether they are very similar to the ones that are here or here or anywhere else. So once we have this information, we need to do two things. First, we need to figure out which are the cells that we have here. And for that, we need to group cells according to their transcriptomic profile. So if they express the same genes, we assume that they are similar. And also we need to rely on previous knowledge to identify which are the cells that we have in each of the groups. So actually, when we do that, the picture that we have here changes dramatically. And then we have something like this. As you can see here in different colors, what we have is the different cell clusters that we have identified. And what you can see is that these cells clusters actually belong to all known lineages in Planaria. And for most of them, we do have differentiated cell populations, progenitor cells populations, and actually a large pool of stem cells, as I told you before, that it's uh, what we expect in Planarians. But now what we can do first is to validate the identity of these clusters. And for this, we can rely on identifying marker genes for some of these clusters. And for instance, this case that is like a marker of cholinergic neurons. And what we can do is validate the identity of the cells by looking at their expression in the whole organism. So as you can see here, these cholinergic neurons, so this marker is actually in the brain of planarias and in the nerve cords. Well, for instance, in this other case, what we did was to identify a cluster that was previously not described. And that what we saw is that these are some type of parenchymal cells that as you can see here, when we look at where this gene is expressed, it highlights all the parenchyma of planarians. So, and this is very nice, but this is just a static picture. And now what we want to do is to understand a bit the relationships between these clusters because we cannot infer this information from this plot. So now what we want to do is to move from these clusters to identify differentiation trajectories to try to understand how different cells relate to each other. In our case, to do this, actually what we did was to use a combination of computational experimental methods. So we started with some experimental data in which we fact sorted stem cells, so dividing cells, and differentiated cells that we identified after knocking down histone to be gene that if, as you know, it's an essential gene for proliferation. And therefore, if you knock it down, what happens is that after a few days, you are left only with differentiated cells that are these things highlighted in blue here at the periphery of the Disney. We took this experimental data and combined it with different computational methods that I would explain now. So the first one was to use a computational lineage reconstruction. So this method basically that is called PAGA. So basically what it assumes is that differentiation is a continuous process and that actually we can reconstruct this process from the single cell data. So the main idea is that cells that are similar are going to be expressing similar genes. So if we go from our, for instance, Disney plot before where we have all our cells, we can connect the cells that are similar to each other and that we have in different clusters, as you see here, highlighted in different colors. And what we can do is project these connections that we see between cells to clusters to define what we call an abstracted graph that is going to summarize the relationships that we have, the similarity between the cells in different clusters. And once we have done that, now what we can do is remove the less consistent trajectory, so the less consistent connections, so the less frequent, to generate what is an abstracted graph. So this method is very good to tell us the similarity and the relationship between clusters, but actually what it's not able to do is to tell us whether, for instance, when differentiated, if we are going from A to B or if we are going from B to A. So to try to understand this, what we did was to use a different method, in this case, RNA velocity, 
that actually what it tried to do is to predict the future state of cells. So just to explain a bit further, what you can what you can imagine is that in a given cell we express a given set of genes and this is controlled by a particular rate of transcription and rate of degradation of the RNA. And what you can imagine is that actually if this cell wants to increase, for instance, the expression of the gene in the future, what is going to happen is that we are going to have more transcription maybe than degradation and we can measure this or if we want to decrease the expression, it's going to be the opposite. So we can actually estimate if this is true or this is happening because we can access the spliced and the unspliced reads that we have in an RNA. And by looking at the ratio of the spliced and unspliced reads, what we can do is predict the RNA content of the cell in the short future. So basically this can serve us to now, let's say, take our original cell and now that we have the future RNA content of the cell, we can project this state and we can draw this arrow that is going to tell us where our cell in our Disney projection, for instance, is moving to. So if we do this for all the cells that we have in our, in our Disney plot, the picture that we get is like this. So now you can see all these arrows here that are actually summarizing these individual trajectories of our cells. And what we can see is that here in this large blob that corresponds to the stem cells, we have very tiny arrows because they are stem cells. They are not moving anywhere. They are just proliferating and dividing. And in contrast, what you see is like when we are going outwards to where all these different colored areas that represent the different lineages that we identified, what we see is that actually these arrows are going outwards and are growing in size, so actually suggesting that this single stem cell pool is giving rise to the progenitors and the differentiated cells. So if now we take this information and we combine it with the computational lineage reconstruction, with the experimental data, and with also assessing gene expression changes along these differentiation paths, what we can do is derive a single uh, lineage tree that is connecting all the clusters that we have identified. So as you can see here in this plot, we have all differentiated cell types that are these ones highlighted with the blue allos according to our experimental data that are connected to progenitor cell types and are rooted to a single stem cell cluster that is giving us the origin of all these different cells. And these lines that you see here are actually the differentiation trajectories predicted by our methods that these stem cells are following. But of course, this is just a plot, and now what we need to do is to validate whether this information and this ordering of cells and differentiation trajectories that we are getting are true. For doing this, what we did was to focus on one of these clusters that we have that are goblet cells and validate whether this pseudotemporal ordering, so this differentiation trajectory for goblet cells was true. For this, what we did was to take all the goblet cell population, as you see here, we ordered it according to pseudo time. So what it means that the cells that we have here at the beginning are the cells that are more similar to stem cells, and the cells that are here at the end are mature, fully differentiated goblet cells. And now what we can do is to look at the expression of known marker genes. So if we do so, what we see is that these more immature cells, for instance, they express higher levels of known stem cell markers and the expression of these markers drops during the differentiation. And in contrast, what we see is that the expression of markers for immature and mature goblet cells peak at different times during the differentiation. Interestingly, we can actually validate this experimentally in Planaria. As I told you, Planarian, they have this large pool of stem cells that are continuously differentiating. And what we know is that the stem cells differentiate at the same time that they migrate. Therefore, what we did was to do an in situ of these two genes to see where these goblet cells, more mature or immature, were located within the animal. So when we do this, actually what we can see is that the cells that are expressing this ATP, so this immature goblet cell marker, are further away from the lumen of the intestine than the more mature ones that actually is more clearly seen here in this overlay picture in which you see that all the red cells are here more in the outskirts and the green ones are closer to the lumen.
So now that we know that actually this pseudotemporal ordering that we obtain actually is reflecting cellular differentiation at least to some extent, now what we can do is to try to exploit this information to identify gene sets that are driving the differentiation of stem cells in vivo. So for this, what we did was to take viable genes from all the clusters that we identified and group them according to their expression in different cells, looking at all the cells at the same time. So in this way, what we are going to find is gene sets that are involved in the differentiation or one or more lineages. So when we do this, actually what we can see is that, for instance, we identify gene sets that are highly expressed in the stem cells and whose expression drops during the differentiation of all lineages. So therefore they are characteristic, gene sets characteristic of stem cells. But we also find gene sets that are specific for the differentiation of neurons or several lineages like epidermal and gut or multiple lineages, suggesting that actually there is a relationship between the differentiation of all these lineages. So they have common gene sets or pathways that are activated. So I hope that with this part, I have been able to convince you that actually we can use single cell transcriptomics to make a cell atlas in an unbiased and quantitative manner, that we can use the cell atlas to reconstruct the lineage tree of an organism. And actually what we can use this tree afterwards is to try to identify gene sets that are driving this differentiation or that are involved in this differentiation. So now we are going to go to part two of the talk in which I would explain you how we can use single cell transcriptomics to characterize gene regulation in time. So the previous part of the talk that I explained you, it's based on a gene-based analysis. So we were looking at gene expression levels in different cells. And this comes from this vision in which we have one gene that gives rise to only one protein. But in fact, what we know is that this is not true. And what we have is that a gene generates multiple isoforms that can be different in their end or in the exon content or at the transcription start site, and they may give rise to different proteins that have different properties or have different locations within the cell. In particular, I'm interested in this isoform here that are the ones that are generated by alternative polyadenylation. So just to introduce this briefly, so alternative polyadenylation is the, so polyadenylation is the mechanism that regulates the end of the gene. So where our gene, the transcription of our gene, and what we know is that sometimes we may have more than one end. So we have, and this is regulated by alternative polyadenylation. In most of the cases, actually what happens is that what we are changing is the, the non-coding region that we have at the end of genes. And this non-coding region contains binding sites for RNA binding proteins, for microRNAs, or even for link RNAs. And these regulatory sites are going to define, for instance, the stability of the mRNA, the localization, the translation efficiency, and therefore are going to be affecting very strongly the final transcriptomic profile of our cells. So to try to see whether first we were able to characterize alternative polyadenylation and single cell, and second, whether we could link it to a biologic process, we decided to study this using hex cells during cell cycle progression. So in this experiment, basically we had cultured hex cells for which we did drop sick. And from this drop sick, what we did was to obtain single cell transcriptomic profiles, just as we did before. But now, given that we know that the highest source of variability of these hex cells is the cell cycle, what we did was to try to develop a new method to actually reconstruct the cell cycle progression using single cell transcriptomics and then secondly, identified isoforms in these individual cells. So to sort the cells according to the cell cycle, this work was done by our collaborators at the MDC. The main idea is that when we are working with single cell transcriptomics, we need to summarize the information that we have in our cells. And we summarize this information calculating principal components. And basically the idea is that given that the highest source of variability that we have in these cells is the cell cycle, these principal components should be reflecting the cell cycle of the cell. And the idea was to develop a method that would do a linear combination of all these principal components to extract the maximum information in just two components and under the assumption that these two components would represent the cell cycle. 
So when we did this in our data, actually the picture that we get is something like this. Here again, what you see is like each dot is one cell, and here we have colored our cells according to the expression of known cell cycle markers. And what you can see is that our method is able to actually reconstruct the progression of the cell cycle as we have cells here, for instance, uh, expressing G2M uh, genes, and then we go to MG1, G1S, S and G2. But now, so we can validate the progression of this ordering by, let's say, cutting here and stretching all these cells along, and then we can look at the expression of known cell cycle markers. So if we do this, what we can see is that, for instance, the this cell cycle reconstruction, so this ordering that we got with this method actually reflects known cell cycle progression. And we can see that, for instance, cycling B1, that is a marker of this cell cycle phase, is speaking here at the end, while, for instance, Eastern 1H4C, that is a marker of S phase, is actually peaking at S, S phase. So now we know that we can reconstruct the cell cycle progression from single cell data. But now the question is, can we identify isoforms? As I told you before, with these droplet-based methods, and in particular, we generate three prime bias reads. So what do I mean from this, with this? So as you remember, we have an oligo DT that is capturing our mRNAs. So when we are doing the library preparation to sequence this data, what is happening is that we have for each mRNA, we generate a cDNA that afterwards we amplify and then we segment, and we generate different fragments. But given that we are adding this index region here, we are only going to be sequencing those reads that are coming from the three prime ends. And the fact is that is for each of the mRNAs that we capture, we generate more than one, more than one final read. So we can use this information to map which are the alternative polyadenations of the three prime ends of our genes. To do so, what we did was to develop a new computational method to identify these sites. So here in uh, colors, what you have are, they represent reads having the same UMI. So it means that they come from the same original mRNA molecule. And what we did was to use this information to identify three prime ends. So first, what we did was to map the reads to the genome. Then once we did it, what we did was to link all those reads that actually were coming from the same RNA so that we can use the information from all these reads to identify our three prime end. And then after doing this, what we did was to divide our reads. So first we analyzed the reads that map to genes that only have one isoform. And we used these reads as a proxy to estimate what's the distribution of our reads to the three prime end. Because we know that these reads come from this isoform, so we can use this information to afterwards assign the reads in the case that we have multiple gene isoforms. So in this way, we know, for instance, that these blue, uh, blue reads here come from the gene B isoform, whereas these other reads come from this other isoform. So now we can quantify actually the different usage of these two sites independently and generate not a gene expression matrix, but actually an isoform expressing matrix. So an isoform in single cells. So it doesn't look so strange. I'm going to show you how this data looks in reality. This is a UCSC screenshot in which we are looking at how the reads map to the two isoforms of CPSF6 gene. So as you can see, CPSF6 has two transcripts expressed in our data, and we have a long 3' UTR isoform and a short 3' UTR isoform. And here in colors, what you have are different cells. And here, these tiny red boxes are this, each of these is one, so the reads having the same UMI. And what you can see is that we have some cells, for instance, these three, that they mainly use this long isoform. So most of the reads that we capture are mapping to this long three prime UTR isoform. In contrast, we have some other cells like this green one here, that is exclusively using this short isoform. And in other cases, we have some of the cells that use both the three prime, so the long and the short isoform. So now the question is, is this usage random or is this actually related? So this variability is stochastic or is actually related with the cell cycle progression? 
So to do this, now what we needed to do is to identify whether these isoforms were variable, meaning that they are used randomly at different parts of the cell cycle, or whether they oscillate. So it means that they have a particular expression related to the cell cycle. And for this, what we did was to take all our cells that we have identified in different cell cycle phases with our math before, and we use a method called metacycle that would identify these oscillating isoforms and they would distinguish them from these variable isoforms. So if we use this, what we can see is that actually we identified hundreds of alternative polyvenation isoforms, so of isoforms that oscillate during the cell cycle phase. So here each of the lines is a single isoform and what you can see is that we have a region where it actually is highly expressed and the expression is higher around here, and then we have all these regions where actually it's slowly expressed. So actually suggesting that the expression profile of the cell of these isoforms is oscillating. But let's say during the cell cycle, actually most of the gene expression is regulated at the transcriptional level. So given that we know that we have all these oscillating genes, for instance, all those involved in cell cycle regulation, it's not surprising that the isoforms of this gene are regulating. So now the key question is, can actually we have gene isoforms from the same gene that have different expression profiles, so they have different oscillation? So for this, we devised a method in which what we did was to given the expression profile of a single gene with pseudotime, what we would do is summarize the expression of all the different isoforms that this gene has by looking at how the position where they have the maximum expression changes with time. So with the standard deviation and then finding the mean position. And then what we can see is that actually we have several genes that have high standard deviation. So whose size forms change significantly between with time. And among these genes, we have several genes that are actually involved in degradation or in cell cycle or proliferation. So as an example, I'm going to show you what happens with MIC gene. So as you can see, this is the expression profile of MIC. In our data set, we identify these two isoform. Isoform 1 that has a long 3' UTR and isoform 2 that has basically a truncate, so no 3' UTR. And what we see is that actually these two isoforms, when we decompose the gene expression level, actually they have different expression profiles. And we see that this Isoform 1 that has a long 3' UTR is mainly expressed in G1S phase, while the isoform with a short 3' UTR is mainly expressed in MG1, suggesting that actually the oscillation of MIC gene maybe is not only controlled at the transcriptional level, but also post-transcriptionally, as we see that the different isoforms have different patterns of expression. So I hope that with this part, I have convinced you that we can use single cell transcriptomics and reconstruct, for instance, biological processes such as the cell cycle. That uh, we can use the three prime bias that we have in single cell droplet based single cell methods to characterize, quantify alternative pollination. And that actually that we identify hundreds of alternative pollination isoforms that oscillate during the cell cycle. So now we are going to move to the last part of the talk in which uh, I'm going to explain you the work that we are doing more right now, in which we are trying to characterize how mouse embryonic stem cells to differentiate to neurons. So in this case, the main idea is that if we set up an in vitro time course differentiation of mouse embryonic stem cells, what we can do is actually, and if we sample cells at different stages during this differentiation, what we can do is actually characterize the different cell populations that we have there. And maybe if we also, we can also try to reconstruct which are the genes that are driving this process. So basically what we did was to pick up cells at four different time points during this differentiation and sequence them. So these are the four time points that we got. So mouse embryonic stem cells, embryoid bodies, and Neurons had two different maturation stages, so mature neurons, TIF17, and immature neurons, and we sequence them using INDROP. So INDROP is a different technology, but it's a, also a droplet-based method technology similar to the one that I explained you before, Dropsic. 
So when we do this, what you can see, this is like the preliminary data. So the first test run, what we see is that actually for some of the samples, we have very few cells and actually the quality of our cells is very different. So we have from 54 to 2000 cells and also the number of genes per cell that we have changes a lot about across samples, both the number of genes identified and the numbers of UMI, so of RNA molecules that we have. But it's still what we wanted to know is whether we can use this data to analyze and whether this data is actually reflecting the differentiation process that we expect. So when we do this and then we do a UMA plot, so a UMA plot is a plot to represent single cell data similar to the TSNI before. So here again, it's thought is a single cell. The first thing that we can see is that actually the cells that coming from the different stages that we sequence are actually clearly separated. So suggesting that we are able to identify at least, distinguish at least the stem cells, the neural precursors and the neurons in different maturation stages. But interestingly, we can not only put all the data together and analyze it, but we are actually able to identify different populations within each of these uh, time points. So as you can see, we find different stem cells and progenitor cells, and then among the cells that are maturing neurons, so D4 cells, we find both maturing neurons and cells that seem to be committed more towards mesenchymal phase or astrocytes, and also we find the mature neurons. We can even validate the identity of these clusters by looking at the expression of known marker genes, and we see that, for instance, the stem cells express classical stem cell markers, the same as neural progenitors or neurons, both general neuron, neuron markers or mature neurons here. And also we have these characteristic markers for both mesenchymal cells or astrocyte precursors. And finally, what we tried to do again, similar to what we did before, was to try to see whether we can understand the relationship between all these clusters. And for this, again, we use PAGA, this lineage reconstruction method that is going to summarize the possible differentiation trajectories that we have within our clusters. So when we do this, we get a graph that just by looking at it, what we know is that it's not perfect because we have some connections like here that we have the mature neurons just close to the stem cells. So clearly this connection cannot be true, but it's still we try to see whether actually this graph is reflecting in some way the differentiation process that we expect. For this, what we did was to select individual pathways, like for instance, this one, and see whether following this trajectory, so the clusters that we have here involved actually are reflecting the differentiation of the neurons that we expect. And actually what we did was exactly that. So we took the cells from all these nodes here, written here up, up, and then when we look at the expression of the known markers of the different populations, and for instance, we see that ESRB, there is a marker of stem cells is highly expressed on the stem cells and then the expression drops during the rest of the in all the other cells and then we see the expression of markers of npcs or of neurons pick at different times during the differentiation interestingly it's not that this path or this is what we will see for all the data because if now we look at what happens with the differentiation of the mesenchymal cells what we see is that this profile is totally different and map for that, for instance, we saw that it increased during the differentiation. Now we see that it drops dramatically as it's not involved in the differentiation of these mesenchymal cells. But in contrast, we see the increased expression of EGF2 or TCN that are known markers of these mesenchymal cells. So I hope that with these, although very preliminary data, I have convinced you that actually we can identify known markers for the different populations using single cell, that we can combine the different populations uh, to generate a computational lineage tree reconstruction, and that actually we are able to identify differences between the cells at different time points. So with this, that will be the end of my talk, but finally, I would just like to tell you a bit what is that I'm going to do here at the Bay at the PCMRC. So as Ankel mentioned before, the focus of my lab is try to understand how post-transcriptional regulation is involved in the differentiation of cells and in particular how it's involved in the development of neurodegenerative diseases. So this is based on the idea that actually it's known that many RNA binding proteins are involved in neurodegenerative diseases. So here what you see is the names of different proteins that regulate different steps 
of uh, RNA processing. Uh, so for instance, transcription, alternative splicing, polyamylation, or transport, or degradation, or even protein translation, mRNA translation. And what we see is that they are linked, so they are known to be related to, with the development of some diseases. So our idea is to actually to characterize this using IPS base, so IPSs. So basically, if we do in vitro differentiation of these IPS cells to different types, for instance, of neurons, what we can do, and we can compare control and patient samples, what we can do is first compare the expression profiles of the different populations that we observe to see if there are differences or not, and also to compare the cellular proportions, because maybe the problem is not that some cells are not working well, but maybe the problem is that we have more of one particular type of cells of and than of the other. And the idea with this is that we will be able to identify risk factors that could be for the development of neurodegenerative diseases. So now really this is the end, and I would just like to thank so the people involved in the work that I have been presenting. So most of the work that I have been telling you was part of my postdoctoral work at the Reyeske lab in Berlin. So and these all the people that were involved in the work together with our collaborators in Munich and also at the NDC in Berlin. The last part of the talk where I was telling you about this neuronal differentiation was done at the CRG where I was doing my postdoc and especially thanks to Patrick that was doing all the cell culture work and the preparation. And also I would like to thank the people in my group, Anna, that just joined the lab a month ago and she's going to take care of all the wet lab. And I would just finally just thank you all for listening to me and joining this uh, webinar. And if you have any questions, I would answer to them now. Thank you very much, Mireya. Um, remember just to raise your hand. I didn't understand in your uh, the velocity. How do you estimate the degradation? Was clear? So yeah, maybe I went a bit too fast on that. So the idea is that when you capture the mRNA within a cell, you not only, so I told you that we use these oligo -DTs, right? But uh, what we know is that first, sometimes you have already, so we can also capture reads that come, for instance, from introns. So we can estimate how the degradation rates and the transcription rates by comparing, for instance, the amount of pre-mRNA, that is what we would assume that is reflected by introns, so number of reads, for instance, that map to introns, to the amount of reads that come from exons that would, or exon-exon junctions that would represent mature mRNAs. And this is the kind of things that you are actually able to estimate. So you estimate the pre-mRNA levels based on intronic reads and the mature mRNA levels based on reads that map to exon exon junctions. And then what you can see is like if you take all your cells and you compare these numbers, you see that more or less these are constant. And then you have some cells that deviate from this constant uh, proportion, let's say. And this is the information that you use to estimate how the cells are changing the content, like in the future, whether they are increasing or decreasing the expression of a particular gene. Does this make any sense to you? I have understood that for the generation, the synthesis of new mRNA, because you can distinguish the, the pre-mRNA of the mature yeah. mRNA, but I didn't know I, how you distinguish the mature mRNA from the degrading mRNA. No, so what you assume is that degradation and splicing rates are constant for each gene, and the only thing that you do is compare the abundance of pre-mRNA with the abundance of mRNA then in some way it's reflecting the differences that you may have in both transcription and degradation of the RNA. Okay. And these constants, you determine them experimentally or, or you just make them up? You assume that they are constant for a gene. So basically the only thing that you do is to, if I'm not wrong, I mean, I haven't looked at the math in the method, but you fit like a, a model to estimate the, these changes and you do this for each gene, and then you calculate this for all the genes that you have in your sample. So that's how you end up having like an estimated, uh, let's say, mRNA content for the cell in the future, like in the nearby future. Okay. Makes sense. I also wanted to, for you to give, if you could 
give us a, uh, some pointers, mostly for, for students, uh, because now everything is single cell RNA. Mm. Uh, but I guess, I mean, we didn't have that five years ago. So I guess there are some instances, I uh, wanted to know your opinion on this, uh, where bulk RNA seq could be as valid as a single cell. So if, if you are planning an experiment, along, so when, when will you use bulk or when will you use single cell? So what I would say is that single cell it still has some limitations. For instance, for the identification of splicing variants. So most of the methods have either not so big throughput or they are way less sensitive. So I think that single cell needs a good approach when you expect to have changes in, for instance, cell composition, or you are interested in it and in, in trying to understand what are the different cells that you have in a tissue and how they are distinguished. But if you, for instance, have, uh, for instance, a cell line and you expect that all your cells are the same, so maybe you don't need single cell transcriptomics because you want to characterize, I don't know, the effect of a mutation. So the sensitivity that you're going to have having bulk RNA sequencing is going to be much higher than if you have single cell sequencing. So I don't think that single cell and bulk RNA sequencing are, ex you know, they are mutually exclusive. I think that they have use for different things. So bulk RNA sequencing is more sensitive for things like splicing, characterization of low expressed genes, like link RNAs or to looking cancers. And then uh, single cell transcriptomics is more useful for when we are trying to disentangle first cell populations and also the variation that is within these cell populations. If you are not interested in, uh, in this, then don't do single cell transcriptomics. That's also important for what you mentioned, low abundance genes or low abundance transcripts, which I think most genes important for cell site regulation mm -hmm. Abundance. Yeah, for instance, in the work that we were doing with the planarias, we realized that we want to characterize this uh, differentiation. Uh, so gene sets that regulate differentiation, we try to focus the analysis on transcription factors, and actually transcription factors are much less abundant than the genes that are downstream in the cascade. So actually those are the genes that, of course, they are not the ones driving the differentiation are the ones that are giving us the strongest signal and are pointing us towards the right players, let's say, in some way. Would you say that this limitation, the, the technology is much better suited to ascribe cell identity than to investigate cell fate regulation? Yes, definitely it is now. But I think that considering the speed at which the technology is advancing, the things that we can do in a couple of years would be radically different from what we can do now. We can wrap it up now and thank everybody. Thank you, Mireya. For, thank you. For the talk. Well, thank you, Lydia, and also Raul for organizing all of this.